Hey, Pronouncers, welcome back to another episode of Printavo Pronouncers Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printavo. Welcome to our kitchen table sort of area. This is a good setup. <laughs> You're just waiting for Crusette to get home. <laughs> We've got an hour before my wife comes back. We've got Mr. Stephen Farrick out of Campus Inc. We were working on a couple things and wanted to record an episode. Thank you guys again for watching this week. We've got a pretty exciting ton of different stories and stuff. We haven't done one of these catch ups in a little bit. Yeah. A lot of times it's been a ton of guests. So uh, there's so much happening and in each of our business worlds. And I I had written a ton of things that I wanted to cover or bring up or talk about. I know you've got some stuff too. the whole DTF podcast. DTF uh, versus DTG podcast. I've gotten quite a few messages from yeah. some, um, I guess you could say upset people one way or the other, which I've invited everybody on, you know, come on the podcast. would love to be able to hear what have it. you. What have you gotten? You know, uh, especially people. And I mean, that was a pretty forcefully saying, Hey, I'm moving. I think DTF is way better than DTG. Mm-hmm. I have no stance. We don't, obviously run a shop. I love being able to talk about it and bring it up though, because tides are shifting and whatever your needs are. I mean, that's the true needs, not always what manufacturers think, but a lot of people, a lot of people are converting their DTGs to DTFs. Oh, shit. I've seen that too. Yeah. So I don't think, I think DTG will have a purpose, but the quality of, of a transfer is in my opinion, so much better than DTG when done properly. Um, so we got the new Cobra Flex is the first model that came out. Um, they're working on like new models right now. I am 100% sold on the technology. I believe it is the future. There's definitely some tweaks on the machine that they're making like in real time. Mm-hmm. So uh, version one. They, so you like the beta? I customer? guess so. Uh, they shipped it to us straight from the trade show. Mm-hmm. So it was at like the trade show in Pittsburgh. Okay. And then they shipped it straight to us and uh, they sent the techs out to work on it. And there's definitely some things that like we have to work through, like whiting c- circulation. Um, there's definitely maintenance that has to be done daily on it. Uh, the machine has to run constantly. And so they're building things in there to make it easier so that the machine can sleep and still cycle properly and things like that. So uh, it's definitely, like I said, I'm sold on it. We love it. It's just a matter of getting everything dialed in and working right. And so I've gotten flooded with messages and people saying like, what's the status? What do you think? Oh, really? What are people asking you? Oh, I'm getting messages left and right of people just asking what, you know, should we buy it? Should we not? And I've kind of just said like, if you want to be an early adopter, you can be an early adopter. Just know that you're... It's going to be expensive. It's a beta. (laughs) I mean, you're going to have to learn through the process, right? Like... I give a lot of credit to the shops that bought the first digital squeegee. Remember when that came out? Like we saw it at the trade shows probably like six or seven years ago. And then we started hearing about people getting them. But those shops that are early adopters, you have to like believe in the product, make sure it's something you're going to struggle with a little bit. It's not all going to be perfect. And you know, right out of the gates and there's going to be issues. So but you're still pretty committed though. Oh yeah. You said I'm you're getting another massage machine Mach- and yeah. So they're, they're working on like, for instance, like the curing, we want to see that the transfers cure for like five minutes. The current chamber setup only allows like a three minute cure, but a five minute cure would be so much better. So they're actually making real time tweaks on it um, and changing things. And so we're actually going to get the next version of it. Um, shipped out to us. We're going to send that one back and then we're going to beat it up and, and try and use it and, and, and all that. So so even with the beta bugs, you're still super committed. Yeah, because the quality is unbelievable. I mean, you saw the shirt yeah. that I put your face on. Right, I saw it. It was pretty nice. Yeah. And one of the other cool things that we're doing with it is um, because we do our own sublimated jerseys, we're bringing in blank jerseys and decorating them as we need them. So like our new locker room that we just launched for the the University of Illinois, we brought in a sublimated jersey that's got all of the piping along the sides, but the front and the back are blank. Mm. So then we can just DTF whatever ones we sell and just ship those out. So we're able to offer the entire basketball team their own collection of jerseys using the DTF 
and blank jerseys. That's the is that the biggest push of using it, or is it still like small quantities? No, jobs? it's totally small quantities. Like for masks and stuff, it's great for when you've got a small like if you've got to run fifty left chests, it's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, it's really when you have to do full fronts, right? Like if you're doing a twelve inch design, you know the machine will print. I mean, call it an inch a minute, maybe. Um, no, not an inch a minute, but like it'll take five minutes to print a full front. So if you had 40 full fronts to do and you could stack two of them side by side, the printer could be running for 25 minutes, which is just a nice, slow, like print, you know, and there's things that, you know, if, if the white ink head starts to go out in the middle of it, what do you do? So we're learning, um, we're becoming mechanics of the machine, um, but we're also giving them feedback and they're tweaking things, which I really, really appreciate. So for that reason, I'm still sold on it. I just, I think for the industry that's like waiting, 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 like the next machine's coming out, it'll be shipped to us. Uh, I'll be pretty transparent about it, but I'm excited. I'm excited for the changes. So, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm jumping around on our, on our list here because, and by the way, if you have DTF related questions, just drop them in the comments. So, so we can gather those together and yeah, I, on another I know episode. Luke's going to do a pretty big cover on it at some point. Awesome. Luke, by the way, if you guys don't subscribe to the weekly, it's a really, really cool episode. We'll drop a link so you can uh, subscribe to that. It's a really cool industry newsletter Luke's been putting on and just sharing all kinds of amazing data and pieces and articles and just things that you can read in the morning. Luke is one of the best writers in our industry. He's very, very talented. (laughs) I mean, just the stuff he puts out. So if you don't subscribe to that newsletter, it's beautiful. Yeah, like it's, it's really good. It's curated. It's it's entertaining. I mean, he covers everything. Um, it's something I read religiously now. You talked Probably. about fulfillment, so I'm just going to drag it over here. Uh, <laughs> you bought Ship Station or no Ship Hero, which was can I say how much? Sure. Or do you want to say? It's, it's expensive. It's two grand a month. Yeah, on an annual or is it quarterly thing? On an annual. Okay. Yeah. So so. Y- you know, I don't think obviously most people have gotten to a point where they might need that, but what, what was the use case of investing that on the fulfillment side? So we're becoming an e-commerce fulfillment partner for a lot of large brands. Um, and that has to do with like inventory and we're trying to eliminate inventory and really do print on demand or I call it decorate on demand. So what we do essentially is we run like 10 different Shopify stores Mm -hmm. and on the Shopify stores, they all use a lot of the same blanks. So a lot of the blanks will use a sport gray crew neck sweatshirt. It might be independent, might be champion, but we try to keep the same blanks across multiple stores. When an order comes in, we want to be able to pull inventory and use it across multiple stores and ship hero is a warehouse management system. It allows you to do that. So it actually like it manages massive warehouses and it'll tell you, hey, you need to stop, grab this transfer from the shelf and heat press it at that station. So do you create like recipes for a design in a way where it says, yeah, it's it's this garment, it's this design, it's a kit, it's It's all a kit label. Yep. And it tells you, it'll say, go grab this sweatshirt from location A12 and then go to this drawer and grab transfer in B36 Mm -hmm. and you scan it and then you go to the heat press and you heat press it. And when you're done heat pressing it, it can actually take a picture of the garment and upload it kind of like Printavo does. Wow. And then it'll say, take it to the shipping place. So because we've got it's well over a thousand orders a week that we're trying to get in and out. We just needed to dial in that process and warehouse management. It's a huge lift. We flew in their team to implement. Adam's been working on it day and night to try and get it to work perfectly. Um, But we're live. We've been shipping with it every day for the last like four or five days. And it's, I mean, it is the future of how you have to do inventory and stuff like that, but it's hard. A lot of, well, it appears that the crossover point was you stocking blanks. Yeah. And that's what, because if people are just ordering on demand, it doesn't matter. But yeah. if you're stocking blanks, you're trying to have that common ground. Now it's where do you pull from, from each different store? Yeah. And once you take, once you start pre-buying inventory, that's a really slippery slope. Yeah. And you have to be very data focused, no differently than a grocery store, 
right? Like I always say like a grocery store has to figure out how much toilet paper to have on the shelves <laughs> and how much cereal to have, or they're going to sell out. Do you do those projections or is so, it just hard? So now we knew we had half as many stores last fourth quarter. So we projected out how much like Carhartt we were going to buy. And then we pre bought like 75% of what we thought we were going to need. Does the system help that you predict that over time? Yeah. So as more data is coming in, you can start to forecast and then you can see previous historical data so that you can make smart buying decisions. So if we're going to be an inventory based company, we just have to, we have to be really, really calculated about it. Um, and I never thought we would get to that, but after I saw how much like, error in purchasing and check-in like it's not bulk purchasing anymore like you have to be very methodical with it so so how many SKUs are you trying to stock then across all these stores probably 50 to 60 really 50 to 60 blanks okay but that includes different sizes too yeah so 50 to 60 so one different style could be six different you know correct SKUs underneath that correct so one style like a champion gray crew neck sweatshirt could be used across six stores. Mm -hmm. And so we also stock the transfers as inventory. And so the system will basically kit the two together and then it'll pull from the blank inventory. So we're even like working with the ship hero engineers because it's a very interesting use case. Um, but because you are paying a premium, <laughs> they are, they will do some customization for you. So if you want Printavo to be how you want it, maybe you should pay two grand a month. <laughs> but seriously, like we're paying $24,000 a year, so they're able to allocate a little bit extra tech to sure. help us out. You know, That's an interesting game on the software space because that's like what uh, Shopify Plus is, is they right. start at 2000, right. but they don't customize it. I mean, they have custom workflows, which you can create automations and this and that. Right but they don't customize the e-commerce platform. But that's the same with like any enterprise software, right? I would just worry so much about getting into... Like we're down Salesforce rabbit hole. True. And we're paying my subscription was six grand a year and we're not live yet. <laughs> <laughs> they just messaged me being like, you ready to re-up? And I'm like, re-up it because we've spent... <laughs> We hired a Salesforce implementation engineer and it's a really big build. Yeah. But we've probably spent fifteen or twenty grand with him this year. Just of customizing it. Just customizing. Sales team. Tech is but like if we decide not to do it, like you'll start to break down. There's a there's a really common theme of many shops hiring independent software developers to build integrations and customize things. And it's fairly common for shops as they're getting larger now. Yeah. And uh, I was helping another shop. They're integrating NetSuite uh, because they're scaling. You know, they've got a couple of businesses and they're growing beyond that. Um, the amount of API questions we get is almost weekly now. But I think if you're a business that's really trying to scale up, and I mean by scale up is you can use the applications that are every day to your disposal, right? You can use monday.com, you can use Zapier, you can use Slack to get you to a certain dollar mark. But after you break through those points, things will start to break down. Mm -hmm. And as they break down, then you require custom builds. But if you look at any large company that has scaled to call it $100 million or $50 million or $20 million, they built something custom. I don't know very many businesses that haven't customized a solution that have scaled up like like right that's i don't know if you could think of one well the it, it seems the processes and the tools and the people like that three combo that you used to get from say zero to maybe 100k 100k to 500 500 to a million a million to three three to ten are different at each bridge right. And I think in our industry, the common shop can probably scale to three or four million by scrapping it together. But I think once you start breaking out of that and you start having employees that are 30, 40 people, like your payroll solutions are, need to be more customized. Your everything needs to be more customized. And that's where you start to spend on it. But you can't even, I can't even think about like, okay, I spent 15 grand on a Salesforce implementation, still less than my, an employee. It's 
just part of the game. I don't know. Do you feel, do you find yourself as you guys scale up, just money is more like water? (laughs) I mean, it's definitely as you scale up, it's, I find it's easier to spend on things that you value, but I think the other thing that we're coming across is just a web of tools to solve things. I mean, we have Zendesk for tickets. We have our uh, clothes for our CRM. We've got, um, you know, intercom for email marketing. Uh, we've got this tool called vitally for customer success and then our just general database in my web of API integrations and zaps. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, everybody hits and it, and, and it feels like now is a point where, okay, Hey, we got to tear some stuff down create one source of truth again. And then that source of truth is where things spawn off. Right. Cause I think what happens is when you have multiple sources of truth, it, that is what creates the problem. It's not bad to have multiple tools. It's bad if like, Oh, well the revenue for this metric is in this tool, but the revenue for that metric is in this tool and receivables are over here. And, and it's just like, it's fine to have different views, but I don't know that that's, it works for a while and until it doesn't and you feel it and you know it. And we're working through that. I mean, we're evaluating the hub spots and sales forces for our, uh, CRM side, which, you know, our business is unique in that it's like a higher volume of, of obviously one-off shops coming in and we have to do that high touch there and get people rolling, but it's a never ending battle. It is. I, I mean, in, I remember fresh out of college, I was a consultant at Abbott Labs over in uh, Waukegan. Just working on COVID tests back in the day. <laughs> the early COVID test. <laughs> uh, they were running so much off Excel and they had huge SAP systems, you know, multi-million dollar contracts to implement this system and that system. And then you just have people running off, you know, managing things in Excel separately. Uh and, and they're always trying to figure out how to scale and get to the next stop. And, and speaking actually of scaling, I've got an interesting story. So, uh, we had a team member recently left, although they're amazing. It was just, you know, our paths and what we're going down is different from what they're looking for. And, um, we realized for this team that they were on, we needed a manager. I was doing it and I still am doing it. I realize I'm not the best. Like I know as much as I can. Um, this is on the marketing side. I know the best that I can to get it where we've gotten. And now who's somebody who's taken a business from X to Y and can, you know, help create those railroad tracks and lay those down. And so I, I, we've talked about this or is like, can a somebody printing be a production manager? Can somebody, you know, doing sales lead a sales team and so on. So I wanted to give that opportunity. And so we've talked about interviewing via projects. So I said, well, let me interview them with a project to see how it goes. And, and let's see if they just blow it out of the park. And then this makes total sense. Mm Mm-hmm. So we created this project, you know, we said, okay, Hey, here's where we're at revenue wise. How do we get there? And what do we need to be able to do? Um, and the first take at the project didn't go so hot. And I'm going to say that in a way where I'm not sure if I didn't give the best expectations of what I wanted from the project or it again, wasn't the best fit either, Hmm. but either way, you know, I was like, how do we do in, this in the interview process? Yeah, this is, well, this is a person that's been with us for, you know, almost a year. So they, they have, you know, they understand internally how we work, but I interviewed them. I was trying to interview them as if I would interview somebody who would take over that team hmm. and to say, create this marketing plan. What does that look like to own it? Uh, Yeah. So it didn't go so hot. And then we said, okay, here, let me help more. Here's more detailed wise what I'm looking for. And then go back. And then we turned out, we kind of split ways, but I'm glad I went through that. I don't know if it will happen every single time like that. I don't know if you've tried this for somebody who wants more responsibility, but that was a taste of what that more responsibility looked like. And it then proved, okay, Ooh, shit. I don't know that that may not work out too well. 
Yeah, I just went through something <laughs> too. Uh, we parted ways with a pretty key employee in production mm-hmm. um, that I almost like I force fed too much and gave too much, but then when they were on their own, couldn't float, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and I go back to the interview process. Did I hire a process follower or a process builder? Were you, you the way you explain that? Were you micromanaging or no? Or what do you mean by you help, like handheld too much? Like if I was there and watching it and micromanaging it, it would go well okay. because maybe out of like either Steven's here, so we're gonna follow it. But then when I'm not there it nothing would happen Mm. and so i think i was in a little bit of denial maybe i was like oh it is going well things i was just trying it was like like i was trying to make it like a self-fulfilling like let's try to manifest it (laughs) it's going to be well it is like almost overly optimistic and i think when push came to shove i realized they didn't have the support of the staff and that too many months were going by and not enough processes were being built And I think that's when you talk about a manager versus an employee and hiring for them is so different. Like how, you know, like my biggest frustration was I bought a label maker Mm -hmm. and I gave it to them and I said, we got to start labeling things. And it sat, that label maker sat there for a month and a half. I was like, I was just so, I was so mad because I was like, can we, can we try to label like four or five things a week? Mm-hmm. You know, I follow like Corey does it every Sunday on his Instagram. <laughs> and so I was like, let's like, I showed him, I was like, let's just start labeling things. Like let's label ink buckets, let's label tape guns. I, and then like nothing would happen. What, uh, how would you have interviewed this person better for that role before? I don't think I definitely interviewed them. I think I just talked at them and made them like think like, ah, oh, this is a good, yeah, I'll be good at this. Got it. But like, did I actually say like, "Hey, build out a build out a calendar for how you would do this"? Build out like I didn't, and then I kicked myself in the butt for wasting months where things didn't get done. Um, And I think when team members see a manager that you're trying to push into a good role and it's not working, you also lose the trust of like the staff. Yeah, they get demotivated. Yeah, we've seen that too. You get afraid of letting somebody go that's an, a non-performer, but when you do, they just rejoice. Uh, we had that with uh, an engineer a while ago, but it was just like, oh, okay, awesome. All right, let's move forward. Yeah, and like I think you almost. Someone was telling me today. One of my employees was like, "You're being too. You're you're letting too much slide." Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? Like being too nice about it, like that's not acceptable in in other places for this manager role, just in another position. Uh. And they're like, and I was like, okay, <laughs> <You're> like, damn. <laughs> um, but I mean, you're I, right, but damn. <laughs> yeah, I think what was I saw this on LinkedIn the other day, but it was like ten things that require zero talent: being on time, your work ethic, ethic, effort, energy, body language, passion, doing extra being prepared, being coachable and attitude. I'd say if you were to pick one of those things out, what is your biggest pet peeve if someone doesn't have this? Let me see this. Being a producer Chris, you're going to have to pop this one up on the screen. Um if they're not doing? Yeah, like what do you what can't you tolerate? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can pick do I have to pick one? Probably work ethic. Work ethic? Yeah. I, yeah. I'd say being coachable. Yeah. I mean, ideally, those are the 10 that you're interviewing, I guess, with then, huh? <laughs> it's to say for a manager role. Right. Because I think when, you, when you're hiring a manager, you're putting someone in power, right? And then you're giving them the keys to run your business or to tell others what to do. And that could be really dangerous if they don't have the same values as you. I just feel like if we fast forward three years and we look back and we were like, what were we thinking hiring that person as a manager? And then compare it to who you have as a manager in three years. Like 
we will come to the conclusion that, wow, yeah, I should have paid a premium for like a real experienced manager to own something, then I don't have to think about it. I mean, it hurts to say, but it, it's... We've had this conversation like three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there as a company internally for us. We're not fully there yet, but... Could it, could it also be because we're not good recruiters and hire... We, like, we're not trained, skilled interviewers. I think also it's it's a budget concern too. Sure. Because, uh, y- you know, like a real true manager is going to be your most expensive team member maybe more than what you were even making at the time. Sure. If I'm honest, like that's what it was for me twice in a row when, when we brought in somebody to own tech and somebody to own sales and success teams. And, um, but those teams, I literally don't have to think about it's, we don't have leads yet in the others, but those teams, I don't have to even think now again, you know, very senior people, 10 years plus experience in that niche and so on. But I don't know. It's kind of like the, uh, damn, are we just screwing around here? But <laughs> how much easier is it for you to let someone go now? Uh, it's the only reason that it's slightly easier is when I'm two levels up, I can objectively balance everything. So I can hear, I know the good things are working on. I know I can hear what the manager is saying is the problem and I've seen patterns happen multiple times. So now, and granted, we're 27, so we're not massive, but I have seen the same correlation of the work ethic or the passion uh, or being on time. And, and, you, and when those happen, and then again and again, and it's over four months, five months, all right, this is not going to work out. I mean, we can say we'll give them another chance and we'll give them another chance, but let, let's just call spade a spade and start looking around. Okay. But do you have any systems in place that track like OKRs and do like monthly check-ins to see like an employee's trajectory? So only on really the sales and support sides. Okay. Cause not that's- on engineering. Cause it's very hard to measure and not on marketing. It's kind of hard to measure still. And not on support. Yeah, I guess support is a little bit like you can measure responses and quality and what people write right. back. But so we're moving to a tool called Leapsum. Leap it's like Sum. Lattice. Um, L, just spelled as it L, sounds. Yeah, Leap S O M E, and it handles all your employee training. Oh, we need something like this. It does all of the re- employee reviews. You, so like one on ones, you fit you. you all your one on ones have to be tracked because like. And I got this from Carson in their company. She has to use Lattice weekly. How much is it? I think it was like $15 per employee per month. Okay. So you put everybody or is it just put everybody in there and then you are all on the same review system. Like everyone gets the same reviews Mm -hmm. and then you can do department reviews. Interesting. But then you're when you set the OKRs for the employees, um, they're actually, what are they called? Objective key results. So they're case by case for every employee, but one could be like, we want to see, you know, we want to see you building out more processes in the next 90 days Mm -hmm. instead of just following processes. So then you could go back to that 90 days later and say, how many processes have you built since we set this OKR? Got it. Um, And I, I think it comes down to like, with small businesses, we don't really focus on human resources, tracking employees and teaching them um, and seeing if you can pull them out of ruts. Sure. Right. Uh, That's probably a failure of ours is if we identify a rut, do we really coach them out of it? Because no one's perfect. 